Right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another session of our virtual summit. Uh, it's so good to have you all here. Thank you to everyone joining us on Facebook. And thank you very much to our panelists who are also with us today. Um, so uh, today we have a very interesting panel once again. Um, we have Ms. Laura, Ms. Laura Cascada, the campaign director for Better Food Foundation, Mr. David Peterson, senior faculty at Sipi 40, and Mr. Tamir Samarakun, our senior program manager at Sipi and Um The session will focus on inclusive partnerships for sustainable and regenerative food systems. Uh, so maybe before we first start, we'll have uh, an introduction from each of the panelists and then we will go on to the presentation. Uh, so just to let you know, most people cannot be here today and I will be moderating the session. My name is Tanasha Ekanaika and I'm the program manager for Site and Trust. Thank you and over to you maybe Laura, we could start with you. Sure, thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Laura Cascada. I'm the campaigns director with the Better Food Foundation and I specifically work on trying to transform our food system to be more sustainable and resilient. Um, and the primary strategy that I'll be talking about today is called Default Veg, and that's a tool that we've put out into the world to let others use um, and implement in their own communities to help with this transition. Um, my background is mostly in environmental science and policy. I went to uh, Johns Hopkins University for my master's degree here in the US in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, have been working in environmental sustainability and animal protection for the last um, 10, 11 years or so. Um, and yeah, I guess that about sums it up. Glad to be here. Thanks, Laura. Uh, David? Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure to be here. My name is uh, David Peterson. Um, I'm originally from Denmark. Um, I live in, in Berlin, have been for two and a half years, and I work with 50 by 40 and be telling a little bit more about that. And my primary work within this, uh, within this network of NGOs is to uh, create the collective strategies at the, the collective targets and goals. Um, as, as one person pointed out, it feels a bit like cow herding cats, trying to get a lot of great uh, people to move in the same direction. And yeah, that, that's sort of my, my primary function within that, developing the strategy and uh, managing the partnerships of all the great partners we have. My background is in philosophy and business management. I wrote on my master thesis on sort of the emerging alternative protein industry, what that means also for like environment, also for culture and so on. Um, yeah, and I'm very, very happy to be here and to be part of this discussion. Thanks, David. Bamita. Yeah, hi, I'm Damita Samarakun. I work as a senior program manager at uh, SlyCan. Uh, my background is uh, mostly engineering, but uh, I work uh, uh, in the agriculture sector, waste management and also renewable energy. Uh, so right now it's like I'm not involved with the uh, agriculture sector and sustainability related to agriculture sector. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, so um, maybe we'll start with the presentations now. So just a quick note to the attendees, if you have any questions, please keep it um, with you until the end. We will have an interactive session. We'll open up the Q&A for questions that you may have. So first we'll go on with the presentation by all of the panelists and then we'll go on to questions. So we'll start with David. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen here. And I hope you yeah, should be able to see it now. And I'm just maximizing it. There we go. Um, yeah, thank you so much again for, for having me here uh, to present a little bit of the, the work we do here. So first uh, off to uh, explain or, or to start out with a little bit of confusion. 50 by 40 is uh, what we call a collective impact organization. Um, we're a small staff of 14 and, and growing. And we sit with uh, around 55 partners and growing as well. Um, with and these partners and the staff as so as such, we uh, we drive um, towards the collective goal of reducing global production and consumption of uh, farmed animal products, so milk, dairy, and eggs, both production and consumption, but uh, with 50% reduction by 2040. With the remaining uh, production being environmentally, socially sustainable, regenerative, and humane. And not only is that the goal, but also the process of getting there is 
what we call just transition, as many of you probably heard about. Um, so including people, people in the process there as well. So that's sort of in a nutshell, um, and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense as I speak further on. These are some of our, our current partners. Um, we're like two years old, um, so still still growing quite a lot. Um, as you might see, we also have um, Better Food Foundation with us here. Uh, Laura, is, so she consider her a colleague. Uh, same with Slack and Trust as well as a partner. Um, yeah, and basically these are the, the very different uh, types of organizations we have across uh, the fields as we sort of divide it into climate change, environment, um, public health, and uh, animal protection as well, which is of course good to reduce the number of farmed animals and uh, the suffering included there. And also what we broadly define as food, food justice. So rights to food, uh, equitable approaches to, to producing and, and uh, consuming your own, your own food. So we try to sort of get all these groups together on a common denominator goal with 50 by 40 sort of being a goal that everyone can get behind. Certain groups want to move beyond that. Others are like, okay, this is a good goal that we can all sort of press towards. Um, first, I'll speak a little bit sort of the issue specifically because now we're talking about food, food systems change at large and shifting to resilient and regenerative um, food systems, which we can definitely get behind at 50 by 40. Yet, uh, what one key aspect of our work is focusing on on the livestock issue as well, um, which looks very different when you come at it from a sort of call it a global north approach with a huge overconsumption leading to obesity and some other non communicable diseases and then in, in uh, low income and uh, to middle income countries as well. It look, looks different, but we're seeing that there's a need to focus specifically on reducing this, hence the a goal of 50 by 40. I'll speak a little bit to the issue and how it's sort of neglected and then a little bit to, to our, um, our way of, of attempting to solve this issue. So if you can see here, uh, we use a lot of land um, to, to grow feed for our animals if we're not directly grazing with them. So it's a lot of our, our uh, global land area that's being used for this, while it doesn't provide a lot of our calories, right? So uh, meat and dairy uh, production gives us only 70% of the global calories and 33% of the global uh, protein supply chain. Um, while we actually use a lot of the fields and arable land on the planet to feed our food first um, for them to us to have it as well. And this leads to, unfortunately, in uh, deforestation, livestock is considered one of the uh, main drivers of deforestation and the Amazon um, to, produce, to produce feed for animals and so on. Um, so this also, of course, uh, states that animal protein, uh, by shifting away from that, holds the, the key to, to the solution of this as well. So if you look at, um, sorry, I'm just going to move this a bit away from my screen here. Um, this is by World Research Institute saying if the high billion, 2 billion high consumers, so Global North, talking Europe, uh, Australia, uh, the US, and so forth, certain countries in Latin America as well, this is high uh, meat and dairy uh, countries, if they were cut by 40% of current standards, that would save an area of land the size of India and also cut um, 168 billion tons of future greenhouse gas emissions, which would be the, like, the total global emissions budget for 2009. So quite a lot could happen if we do shift towards eating more plants directly and shifting our land there. And this is done through you know, not cutting down the rainforest and emitting all that CO2 or mangrove forest, which I know is a, a big thing in, in, um, in India and Sri Lanka. Uh, and then just making more land for like uh, reforestation and so on to actually carp capture carbon again. We could have so much more land to be doing with. Oh, uh, sorry, just got a click here. Yes, um, this is of course uh, supported by a growing amount of any evidence such as the Eat Lancet report that many of you probably have heard about, um, looking at also healthy diets, taking that into account, having a, a, a good amount of food for everyone and, and healthy calories as well. And they're also saying to stay within planetary boundaries, we need to shift towards uh, heavily plant-based diet. And of course, we're talking here about specifically the, the reducers, the onus of that is in people in the global north who overconsume a lot. Also by the latest IPCC climate change and land report, which also speaks to the issue of just transition. 
So when we have uh, 1.1 billion farmers across the globe, primarily in subsistence farming, so providing for their immediate family and community, uh, not the big um, agribusiness complex as such, um, who might produce like the, the most amount of calories, but a lot of people are actually employed, they depend on, on agriculture for their livelihood. So we need to make sure that, and out of these, I think it's around 60% of those uh, subsistence farmers that are women. So also it has a gendered aspect. It's important to, to make sure that these people are, are taken into consideration when we do this shift as well, that to not just bulldoze their livelihoods and so on and make sure that they are, uh, they are with us. As one, one um, partner organization used, used to say, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So it's really important for 50 by 40 cr to create a space where all these different groups can come together and come up with the solutions that, that fit them all. Um, and one way to sort of illustrate the neglectedness of, of this issue when it comes to specifically livestock, and I'll get into this by just looking at the funding aspect. As you can see here, um, the global climate change mitigation budget, so our global spending from private and public funding is around 431 billion every year, and I think it's set to increase. And as you can see, livestock uh, by a conservative account is accountable for 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And it's projected to actually, because we're already doing some good things on energy and, and transport and so on, it's actually projected to take up much more, like up to 80% in 2050 of the global carbon budget, if the production does not um, stop or halt or reduce in some way. So you can see this, it, and when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, just looking at that, not looking at public health, not looking at land use and so on, it takes up it's like it's 14.5% of the problem. But uh, in our estimate, and I'll get a little bit more into that, it's less than 1%, as you can see here on the graph down to the right, on the money that's spent to fight climate change, it's less, less than 1% going into to dealing with the issue of livestock. So there's a huge mitigation potential here if we do start shifting towards that and looking at livestock and alternatives to production, better types and so on. Um, and here's just cutting it a little bit into pieces here. You can see uh, out of the two, 2015 to 2016 averages on climate change mitigation, uh, it's, it's four, $4 billion that's spent on agriculture, forestry, land use, and natural resource management combined. So this is to say that's, def that's under 1% and it's definitely not only spent on shifting our towards more plant-based diets. So there's a huge uh, um, strategy here with a lot of potential to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, as, as I said earlier, for 50 to 40, we're also looking at the process, right? So we have a 20 year goal, uh, sort of clear set target, and we are trying to gather all these, these different forces from across the, the food system sector towards this common goal. And we need to ensure that everybody is at the table to create uh, the, the future that we want. And there's, as you can see here, there's a few things when it comes to, to food justice and workers right across the whole uh, food chain workers. Um, yeah, the whole production of, of food as such, uh, as you might've known with coronavirus, hotspots are linked to meat processing plants and so on. Uh, workers are not treated, treated justly. And a lot of farmers are heavily indebted when it comes to, for example, the US and, and Europe to this type of livestock production. So we need to make sure the subsidies and incentives to shift and new, new jobs are created. And luckily there's an, a new report just came out, I think a month ago, showing that Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, if or hopefully when they shift to a carbon neutral economy by 2030, they would create 21 million new jobs. And out of those new jobs, 19 million would come from the shift to a plant-based production system for food. And it would mean a net loss of 5 million jobs from the livestock industry, but actually still a net increase of 14 million jobs. So there is studies to indicate that certain areas shifting to a plant-based uh, food production system will actually create more and more resilient um, jobs, plus just co-benefits of healthier diets, less greenhouse gas emissions, and so on. So what we do at 50 by 40, as you can see here, I've tried to to summarize this with a little bit of a, a uh, visualization here. Uh, if you, you start on the, on the low here with individual action, this is what some groups do. There's already a lot of good collaboration uh, going on also way before 50 by 40 came into existence. And we're trying to take a lot of the, the good work that's being done both on sort of the individual actions of groups and try and shift it more and more up from to coordinated actions where we 
align our efforts a lot more. Um, we, we start sharing information about the best practices so we can learn from each other and accelerate uh, collective learning all the way up to collaborative action, which we call collective impact, where we're all sort of aligning all our, uh, our voices and our efforts towards, towards one, one common goal. And I can happy in the discussion to speak more to examples of what that looks like. But yeah, for, for now, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna end it here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, David. That was well under time. <laughs> and uh, I think that will leave more room for discussion. Uh, we could move on to Laura. Great, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Again, thank you for having me. Um, and David's um, presentation was a great introduction because like he said, Better Food Foundation, my organization is a member of 50 by 40. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about a strategy that we use um, and that we're using more and more in these collaborative kind of partnerships um, to meet some of the goals that 50 by 40 um, aims to achieve globally. Um, and this strategy is called Default Veg. Me put to the next slide. There we go. Um, so just to start off, I wanted to introduce a study uh, from the University of Cambridge. Uh, they collected data on more than 94,000 meals served in their cafeterias and found that the proportion of meatless options doubled. Uh, when that proportion doubled, the overall sales remained constant, but the sales of the meat-containing meals dropped, whereas the sales of the vegetarian meals increased from between 40 and 80%. So that was a really interesting finding. And that brings me into the idea of defaults. And so I wanna use an example here um, through organ donation. So typically with organ donation, you'll see that people have to opt in to participate. So they'll go in and maybe they get their driver's license in their country and it asks them if they would like to opt in to be an organ donor. You can see with countries that use this model, the opt-in rate is pretty low, ranging from about four to 28%. Um, but then if they switch it around and um, people actually have to opt out. So by default, they are organ donors and they have to opt out if they don't wanna be organ donors. You can see that between 86 and actually 100% of people remain organ donors. And that's simply because of this nudge of using a, a default and people don't like to stray from the default. They like to sort of do what the group is doing. And so it's sort of shifting what we see as the norm. So putting these concepts together, we have an idea called default veg, which is really just a fancy kind of branding word that we use for a really simple concept. Um, default veg is the concept of offering plant-based meals by default, and then giving diners the choice to add meat or dairy in upon request. So it's just a very simple idea of structuring the menu to be plant-based um, as the default. So that's kind of the opposite, at least here in the US of what we normally see. We normally see you know, the hamburger and the steak as the main option, and then you can opt in for the plant-based or vegan option. So it's kind of turning that on its head and flipping it around. Um, this is a really simple strategy. Um, it's easy to implement. It's also a really inclusive strategy, which I think is really important to highlight. Um, and we think it's probably the most inclusive way that you can serve food because nearly everybody can eat fruits and vegetables. Um, it's really rare to have, you know, an allergy to basic plant-based foods. Um, and those who do want meat can still opt into it. So it's not taking away their choice, but it's really just reframing and giving them a powerful motivation to choose the uh, more resilient and plant-based option. And um, it's also cost effective. It's, it's cost neutral or it can even save costs. And we're not talking about, you know, switching everything from uh, hamburgers to fancy veggie burgers like here in the US we have the Beyond Burger um, so we're not talking about that most of the time we're talking about you know very basic whole foods plants um, vegetables grains etc and um, really just culturally appropriate foods too so making sure that these are items that would be you know rich and healthy and locally sourced um, and items that are very familiar with people for their own cultural needs and it has a significant impact. So as we saw in that study, it can create, or it can increase the plant-based meal serve by 40% and also reduce um, carbon emissions. 
So here's just an example of a study that was done on um, using this default veg approach at Harvard. And the study basically had two groups and they were presented with the different default meal options. And when offered the plant-based default, um, you can see that there was a 43% increase um, when that was used in the selection of the plant-based option. Another quick study, um, this was in Denmark in 2017, and this had an even greater success rate. Um, so using default plant-based options, they found up to about an 85% increase in the amount of vegan meals served just by changing that default. We also did some calculations on the impact of using this plants by default strategy and found that on average you can save about 1.6 kilograms of uh, CO2 per plant-based meal. So when multiplied up a thousand of those meals, like say at a conference or in an institution's um, cafeteria, would be 1600 kilograms, um, which is like driving over 4,000 miles. Moving on to talk about our partnerships with other institutions and organizations. Um, so the first way we partner with other entities is by directly partnering with them to switch their own menus over to a default veg style. So we work with cafes, we work with conferences and events, we work with offices, um, and our really big push right now, our new strategy, kind of sub-strategy within um, default veg is um, going to cafes and trying to shift um, their default milk that they're putting out with teas and coffees to be plant-based. Um, it's a very, very simple switch. You know, instead of offering dairy-based milk, they can offer plant-based milk as the default, and then people can opt in to the dairy-based milk. Um, but it's a very important and also more inclusive shift. Um, we have, you know, dug up some research that found some really startling facts that um, you know, a lot of people suffer from lactose intolerance, and this is particularly prevalent in the African American community, um, the Jewish community, American Indian community, um, and Hispanic community. So, and these are high, like majority of people who suffer from lactose intolerance. So by offering like oat milk, for example, by default, it really opens up the menu to these um, demographics more and also eliminates the idea of having an upcharge uh, for these, I guess, specialty milks, these more resilient plant-based milks. Um, so here's some of the services we offer for these institutions. We do consultations with them. Um, we promote, you know, their efforts and we give them a lot of different materials for restructuring their menus and um, educating their consumers about um, why they've made these changes. Here's one example. Uh, the American Lung Association was one of our adopters and they used default veg for one of their conferences. And here's just a little quote. They, they thought it was really great and helped um, align with their sustainable and healthy mission and their participants didn't even question the lack of animal products. Another big way that we partner with folks, especially people um, affiliated with schools, so students and faculty and staff, um, is our ambassador program, which invites students and school groups and other community groups to become an ambassador and implement default veg in their communities. And um, we have a specific uh, program within our ambassador program that we are executing with the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. Um, and this is a really cool partnership because students are um, officially interns, they're hired and paid as interns, and then they get to choose whether they want to implement default veg in their campus or if they want to implement FFAC's program of Green Monday. And Green Monday is a actually US-based spinoff um, from a Hong Kong-based organization that was founded in 2012. And uh, the goal of it is to promote healthy and sustainable living through vegetarian advocacy and food rescue initiatives, um, enabling corporations, restaurants, schools, and the public to 
um, live more sustainably by implementing these Green Vegetarian Mondays. Um, so you can see a couple of examples of how Green Monday has really helped um, two different institutions, the California Department of Health and Washington University, really reduce their resource usage. So students get to kind of pick and choose what's going to work best for their campus and then implement it. And we work together with FFAC to help and guide students um, through that process. We also have some partners in the faith community. So one of our biggest partners is JIFA, the Jewish Initiative for Animals, and they've um, successfully implemented this idea throughout the Jewish community at different um, synagogues and other organizations. And um, they have partnered with Hazon, which is the largest faith-based environmental organization in the US um, to uh, have default veg approved as one of their um, options for the seal of sustainability. So that helps Jewish organizations align with a sustainable um, menu. And then also Creature Kind, which is a Christian based organization, actually founded default veg. So they were using it a little while before we even started using it um, over in the UK. And we've adopted it here for the US, but um, they've been successful at reaching a large Christian base uh, with this strategy. Within the climate movement, we've been teaming up with a lot of different organizations, which is also, you know, really overlapping with the work that 50 by 40 does. Um, and this is just one example of a webinar we hosted um, with other organizations like Youth Climate Save, Genesis Butler is a young activist who's um, really active here in the US. Um, and Greenpeace, New York University, Zero Hour. Um, so we co-hosted this webinar to talk about different strategies to kind of move the world to a default veg world. Um, and we find that default veg really works well with these other organization strategies because um, a lot of them have um, goals that they're trying to reach like 50 by 40's goal, like they want to reach a certain amount of carbon emissions reductions by a certain year or meat reduction by a certain year. And um, so they get institutions to commit to that. And then default veg is a great strategy to help um, meet those goals. And so it can really nicely fit with other commitments like um, World Resources Institute has a cool food pledge and default veg can be used as a way that institutions meet that by the, just shaping their menus differently. Um, also, there's a program called the Good Food Purchasing Program that um, contains um, a piece where institutions can commit to meat reduction. And so this is another good strategy for cities and other institutions to use um, when they're actually presenting their menus. And then that'll uh, um, alleviate some of the pressures to purchase meat in the first place um, because there's less you know, demand for it because of the way the menu is structured. Um, and then just a current example of the work we're doing right now in the city of San Diego, which is in California, we've put together a large um, coalition of local and national groups to encourage the city to adopt a plants by default strategy for its new climate action plan that it's updating this year. Um, and we are working with groups like the Endangered Habitats League, Intertribal Youth, the San Diego Audubon Society, uh, the Sierra Club of San Diego and other groups um, in writing a letter to the city urging it to consider this approach and in incorporate meat reduction into its strategy because like David mentioned often um, the the costs of animal agriculture are not factored into some of these climate plans um, and so we have about 15 partners right now and we're working to just encourage the city get comments in and make sure that they're hearing from a really diverse um, sector of the of their local community and hearing that you know this is a key part of making menus more inclusive and sustainable and resilient and then lastly, we um, provide resources for other organizations to use. So this is just an example of our recipe tool, which as far as we know, it's the largest vegan recipe search uh, tool available online that's exclusively vegan. Um, and we offer, a, we just basically aggregate uh, recipes from all over the internet. So if you click on them, they go back to the original source. And um, we like to highlight a lot of different like 
uh, recipes from different cultures and work with organizations to give them collections of recipes that are really uh, fitting for their demographics. So we've worked with groups like the Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland um, to put together their own recipe collection that they can use with their audience. Um, we also are working in combination with groups like the Afro Vegan Society to um, help promote their materials and provide them with tools that are useful for their work. Um, so just a lot of like cross promotions and collaborations and um, just offering Default Veg as a tool that can be used and adapted however organizations see fit. And um, specifically, one of the things I'm excited about coming up is here in the US, we have Thanksgiving coming up, which is often, it's a very controversial holiday because in a way it, it kind of celebrates the colonization of our country. And so there's a movement to decolonize Thanksgiving and we're um, gonna be teaming up with some tribal organizations to really highlight the work that they do and rethinking what we see as the norm. And you know, the normal Thanksgiving doesn't have to be a turkey at the center um, celebrating the European colonization of the country. So um, just a really different um, view and trying to um, reshape what people are thinking of as normal. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, when we don't find that this, uh, some, an initiative is something that we personally can execute as a white led organization, we reallocate a lot of our funds. I think it's about 45% of our funds that go um, reallocated toward people of color led, black led, um, and women led organizations to do their own community work um, because, you know, we feel like they're most able to reach the demographics that they're um, interested in and um, provide. Um, the most culturally appropriate, you know, strategies for those communities. So we definitely um, keep that in mind and try to um, be as inclusive as possible and just, you know, provide resources for folks, but let them pave the way and lead the way. Um, and then my final slide, just reminding everyone that now is the time to hit the reset button. So, um, you know, the pandemic has really slowed things down, but it's definitely not put a stop to our work. And it's a good time to just reconsider our norms and reconsider our policies. And so, you know, if you're listening and you're interested in becoming an ambassador or you want to become an official partner of ours or think the strategy might work for your group, definitely get in touch with us. And here is my contact information. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. This is very interesting. Uh, it's interesting because here at Like and Trust, we have a program of Meatless Monday, which is uh, part of our work that we do on wildlife and uh, promoting sustainable lifestyles. And also, I mean, I didn't realize that the change in narrative is actually what we're doing because for our events, we generally have vegetarian food and no one really questions it but uh occasionally there's someone who come and ask you know why wasn't there any chicken or anything and we're like you know it's part of see it's, it's interesting because we never realized that we were changing the narrative as you said by making veg the default option but uh once it's once it's given as an option no one really questions it because that's what it is yeah, and, uh, yeah definitely. Uh, thank you very much that was very interesting uh so moving on to our final presentation with damita uh as you mentioned Sinasha, <clears throat> so i uh talk a bit what uh, about what's like and trust us in terms of uh, sustainable resilient food systems mostly based on our partnerships uh, it would echo actually uh, in we are either you know part of uh, some of the uh, uh, organization that was presented now or uh, work mostly in line with the, the things that was mentioned so like and trust is actually uh, the think tank Um, yeah, uh, so we act as a think tank mainly uh, working in a regional think tank. We work in uh, Asia and also in Africa uh, in uh, various aspects like empowering youth and women, uh, climate resilience, uh, risk transfer, again related to climate, developing sustainable ecosystems, animal welfare, uh, climate related migrations. So uh, when we talk of uh, sustainable food systems, uh, key areas that we work in is like, you know, working with smallholder farmers, especially uh, how climate change has affected the, the small farming systems, both uh, livestock and uh, crop-based farming. So how uh, risk transfer mechanisms could work for them, uh, how indigenous knowledge uh, would, uh, and capacity building in those areas would support uh, the smallholder farmers. 
then sustainable ecosystems with regard to uh, mangroves, uh, uh, reforestation, uh, increasing biodiversity. We work on those areas with different uh, national and international partners. Uh, climate related migration is a key area that we work, which we think is uh, uh, related to sustainable food systems because most of the people who migrate uh, are the smallholder farmers because of the, uh, <coughs> the impact that they are facing. And for sustainable food systems, smallholder farmers are key looking at countries, especially developing countries, uh, uh, whole food system chain. Uh, so if they move out from the equation, uh, it's very difficult for us to talk about sustainable food systems because then it would be based on large scale like industrial food processing uh, uh, companies who would be <coughs> Uh, filling in the vacuum. So we work on these areas. We do research and education. Uh, we uh, partner international platforms to take their voice uh, into those level. We work in policy advocacy. I'll be talking a bit about in the next uh, uh, slides. Uh, specifically capacity building and training of smallholder farmers, youth, uh, women uh, in these areas and also conducting pilot projects where we could take the success stories uh, to the next level for uh, you know, scaling up and then policy influencing. Yep. So as uh, you know, in the international level, we partner with several uh, large scale international organizations, even with the uh, UNFCCC, Southern Voices of Adaptation, uh, Human Society International, Ensure Resilience Global Network, and uh, a few countries in uh, Asia and uh, Africa. Uh, specifically, in, we partner with the governments in these countries and then trickle down uh, to even up to the grassroots level. Uh, what we do is like we take the, uh, you know, grassroots level voice uh, through our pilot projects or the research uh, activities that we do, uh, take those learnings to the national level or then <clears throat> taking, uh, also bringing down the international level uh, agenda and platforms uh, to be implemented in these countries, uh, aligning to the national requirements. I take a country as Sri Lanka for an example, how we work in this uh, in, in the national and local level. For example, we have a few uh, projects. Uh, one is on animal welfare. Then we have, uh, as I mentioned, climate <coughs> restaurants, so looking at the agriculture and uh, animal production sector. Uh, then uh, increasing biodiversity, mangroves and uh, reforestation. So in these activities, we work with uh, the national ministries and the uh, national level authorities, for example, if you take Sri Lanka, uh, Marine Environmental Protection Authority, the Forest Department, the Agriculture Department, uh, relevant uh, national departments to take the voice from down bottom and also international agenda, you know, supporting these agencies to, you know, uh, internalize, uh, bring down the national requirements into the uh, planning level. So these days we are engaged with the uh, development of the national NDCs, the national determined contributions of the country and also support the uh, national adaptation plans of few countries. So we bring in the voice of you know just transition, the need of just transition, engaging uh, gender equality in, uh, when we bring, uh, develop these <coughs> national level agenda. Uh, we work with the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the women's groups, youth societies, farmer groups, uh, work with them, try to understand because some of them have real uh, was mentioned by uh, Laura as well, the, the local level knowledge, know-how, how they work is very important when uh, aligning the international agenda uh, uh, to the local level implementation. Media is a key uh, partner when we work because it's very important to take the message uh, strongly and appropriately to different level of stakeholders. So we work very closely with the media. Uh, <clears throat> Yep, youth is a specific group uh, that we, you know, uh, advocate and work with because we believe the future is theirs and uh, how they engage in these uh, aspects is uh, critical. Uh, so training, uh, developing their capacities, connecting them to the international uh, platforms, uh, build, building their capacities is a key area that we work as like and trust is uh, focusing on. Uh, we, we have this, uh, uh, was mentioned by Senashi as uh, well, you know, the Meatless Monday, uh, uh, we work with uh, Human Society International in our workshops, uh, we, we uh, provide uh, vegetarian meals. Uh, one, uh, you know, important thing that came from David's uh, presentation, like, you know, we could actually link the carbon saving as well. We were 
mostly promoting on the uh, uh, the animal welfare side and uh, health aspect of it but there is uh, you know the uh, emission reduction aspect as well so there are many things actually that are in line which we could partner and work together and uh, you know develop collaborative partnerships in future yeah i'll stop from there yeah thank you thank you damita um that was uh, insightful. So maybe before we open, okay, so just to let everyone know, the question box is open. There's a little Q&A box, so you could drop your questions in the chat and we'll take them forward. I actually have a question from each of you that I made note of. So maybe I'll start with uh, Danita, and we'll just work backwards. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, maybe just, uh, just backtracking a bit. So you did mention certain uh, stakeholder partnerships and that some of the work that we've been doing. So now like certain topics, like let's say just transition and even introducing something like sustainable and production and production. I mean, from a South Asian point of view, they are very sensitive topics, especially when you're approaching stakeholders. So how do you like, how do we kind of, when we approach this, to bring this topic to the table with these stakeholders, how do we go about this? Like, what is the general process from your opinion? yeah it's actually a gradual process of uh, shifting the messages from top to bottom bottom to top uh, scenario uh, if you take say just transition we when we work with the grassroots level organizations the groups uh, women's associations we you know hear their voice what they need and how uh, uh, they are impacted with that so that message we gradually take on for the local level like for the local governments then uh, beyond that, the national ministries, the agencies that are working in specific areas, and uh, also bringing down whatever the changes that are suggested from national level, for example, the NDCs. Uh, when we work with these groups, we know how it would impact them. So uh, at that table, we bring in, you know, the, this is the way how it could impact these uh, uh, grassroots level stakeholders. On the other hand, uh, we help support the national level entities like the government ministries, the, even the private sector to take uh, through their messages to the grassroots level. So having working with organizations like us helps them to, you know, uh, take through the message in a, in a more uh, effective manner because sometimes their language does not really reach the, the people properly. So that's how actually we take it. It's, it's a back and forth way. We don't, uh, you know, go, uh, uh, you know, in, in a in a locking horn <laughs> sort of a scenario with uh, the stakeholders, we see uh, everyone as partners who are important in the uh, overall equation. Uh, yeah, so that's how we actually engage different partners in these uh, taking across the message, ensuring especially uh, things like just transition and sustainable consumption and production. Uh, because sometimes, yeah, as you are correct, sometimes people see these things uh, are you know too alien to us it's not something that we should be doing specifically if we are a developing country we should you know uh, take the path things. and then you know turn back <laughs> so yeah all right uh, thank you very much so i there are a few questions coming up but i will first ask mine so uh going back to laura um so actually i just realized that um like uh what you also mentioned about default with as we don't actually practice this in Sri Lanka as much, but in India and Nepal, like I've seen that the vegetarian option is always cheaper. So people will by default opt for the cheaper option because they get to save money on it. I don't think they obviously look at the long-term impact on it, but the cost is obviously, um, I think, a great factor to bring in. Uh, so just um, as, I, as I said, uh, work on meet this Monday where we try to promote the uh, consumption of production that's a project we do in partnership with. Um, yeah, so just want to know because we also try to form partnerships with uh, restaurants and institutions, but it's, it's always been like a barrier to entry because uh, vegetarian food or say vegan cafes, they are looked at as an elite source of uh, I mean, there's, 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 it's not always accessible. So just, just curious on like how, how you maybe, uh, when, when forming partnerships, is it that the institutions approach default with, or does it work but the other way around? And if so, what is the sort of conversion, like unique selling points 
for them. Like how I know that you spoke a bit about it, but especially specifically on these partnerships, like what is the point that helps them convert and make vegetarians the default option? Yeah, definitely. So it is, I, I think there is a common kind of misconception about vegan and plant-based food that it's always this elite and expensive um, uh, thing to do. And especially here in the U.S. because there are a lot of products that have become really popular that are also very expensive. And I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to make those products more accessible to people. Um, right now, the, the price point is very high, but we focus on um, elevating um, existing menu options that institutions might already have, or um, you know, if those options seem bland to help spruce them up a bit and make them more exciting, but still really focusing on um, basic and local ingredients um, that you know, are easy to source and also delicious and flavorful. Um, and we provide consultations and trainings to help them um, come up with the most appealing menu. Um, but we frame it as something that's not uh, a more expensive shift. It's uh, at least cost neutral, but it can be cost savings just depending on, you know, what they're replacing the the meat with if they're really cutting back on like, you know, steak and things like that in favor of beans, that's obviously going to be a lot um, less expensive here. So I would say that, you know, our partnerships are started in a variety of ways. Um, but the main, I think, key thing is that they're started by the stakeholders who are really involved with those institutions and that's where we have the most success. So with schools, um, students actually going to the schools and attending the um, the school and visiting the dining hall every day are the most um, likely to be able to change the practices there and uh, re or shift the menu and you know make plant-based defaults uh, gain some traction and they we teach them how to work with you know faculty members and how to get support from campus groups and their organizations and sort of so I think every big initiative is sort of a, a grassroots collect collaboration between people in those communities and that's way more effective than us you know just trying to go in from an outsider i mean sometimes that does work if we find you know a cafe that just really loves the idea we're able to work with them directly but a lot of times it's you know it's best to have the um, people in the community working directly i'm not sure if that fully answered your question but hopefully <laughs> it did and uh, finally the my question to david uh, just so for the benefit of everyone joining us we are also, as David mentioned, one of 50 by 40's partners, and they are one. I mean, we we are part of their communications working group. And early towards the end of last week, we also had a session with ProVeg International, that's also a part of the network. So this entire two weeks has been a very, I think, fruitful conversation, engaging with these partners, and uh, you know, making just just bringing the, the the discussion to the forefront. So uh, just a quick question, uh, David, before we move on to the questions. So uh, you mentioned uh, you did speak on just transition and that's been one of the topics that we've been talking about a lot uh, in, in this virtual summit. So, um, and one of the main concerns that has been coming up has been on funding, reskilling, technology and knowledge transfers, and especially with uh, the countries in the Caribbean and Latin America that you mentioned with the new for green jobs that will be coming up. Um, how do you, I mean, of course, this will take some time, but is there, this, are, are the systems in place or is there work happening to bring these systems to the ground? Because there is a lot of shift in, because there's also the top uh, concern of indigenous cultures and what they've been practicing. So it's, again, like what David mentioned, it's a very sensitive topic for certain things. So just wanted to get your opinion on it. Yeah, thank you. You called it a, a quick question. There's a lot of, of different cascades there, but it, it, it also speaks to the complexity of the food system for sure. Um, yeah, so, so if we, I think it's very regionalized, right, when we talk about it. Um, so, for example, it's, it, it, we talk about Global North, which where we, it's, it's a general pattern that is there, heavily industrialized uh, uh, when it comes to livestock issue, factory farm system and so on, heavily subsidized and so the incentives are very much for farmers to go in this and big, go big or go home, right? Which leads to overproduction and so on, and a lot of um, crops to feed these uh, animals are coming from, for example, Latin America 
and, and elsewhere, right? Which is driving deforestation and the displacement of indigenous people living in those forests and those communities as well, right? So, so it's all sort of linked, but in the north, northern sort of hemisphere in general, what we call global north, we, we see one pattern, right? And a lot of focus is on those consumers to, to consume a lot less. We did a consumption map. Um, so sort of what, what, what like consumption patterns look like if we had, when, when we achieve uh, 50 by 40 so in 20 years, uh, it would, from current standards, it would actually mean like the US um, um, and most countries in Europe would reduce by around 80% of their current uh, animal product consumption, right? And actually certain, there's certain countries in Africa where they could increase, right, to meet nutritional standards. So we're sort of, sort of trying to balance that, that scale out, right? So there's sort of equal access, access to food as well with the onus being on those who, who consume the most. So when we come into, and let's take the example of Latin America, because luckily, as I mentioned, there's this report that just came out and looking at it. And in the report, they say how many uh, jobs could be created and also a bit like how that process would look like. Um, yet they're also admitting that this is just, uh, with so much research, right? Uh, it's just a modeling of a scenario. They're saying there's a lot of, of cultural uh, challenges to overcome. Um, as, as like meat is heavily ingrained in a lot of Latin American culture with barbecues and so on when it comes to similar in country I came from Denmark there's one professor who said very beautifully the Danes feel the same way about their meat as Americans feel about their guns there's this sort of second amendment rights uh, um, pride in, in eating that much unfortunately it's linked with masculinity this anthropocentric worldview and so on so it's very close to our understanding of ourselves as species, as the sort of dominant species on the planet. Um, actually, as and Laura mentioned this as well in her presentation, uh, when they sort of put out on display and celebrate um, uh, more traditional cuisines, especially from, uh, so say, the developing nations, where like India is one example, huge variety. It's like, I think it's 33% vegetarians or 80, 28 or something like that. Um, They've just traditionally been eating this way and a lot of it. So the livestock consumption levels that we're seeing now is even in the West, it's only like 30 years old or a little bit more, right? It's just because of the, the massive production, which scaled up and been, become so accessible. So it's even quite new, right? So when we do backtrack, there's a lot of pride uh, to be found in culinary heritage as well. Um, and the shift towards, uh, you know, fast food and McDonald's and a lot of burgers is actually coming with a huge toll for a lot of groups where, you know, when you have McDonald's sort of entering a country, uh, there's just some example studies from the Japanese diet, right? That's shifting with a lot of more young people jumping on the quote unquote happy meal wagon, but it's to the detriment of their health, right? They're not living as long. So I think that there also needs to be a tale of, of how um, it's not that good for us. It's not in our own interest to be eating that much as well. Um, so I, so I think that's something we need to, we need to make part of a larger conversation on what, what's the good life, right? Uh, me, I've, I've lived without uh, any animal product for now uh, 11 years, I think, and I feel very great. I feel great health. I can, you know, I feel very active in my job and a lot of other things. So I think it's good to put those things on display. For example, the movie, The Game Changers uh, made a point about that, uh, combining the plant-based uh, diets with athletic performance and so on. I think there's a lot of di differences there. I think I might have strayed a little bit from, from the topic on drug transition, but I think right now the main driver of, as you mentioned, the displacement of indigenous people or the local communities is the huge appetite for uh, animal products, specifically in the West, right? And unfortunately, often we see sort of a bit of a cultural copy paste, right? We see it, okay, we're developing and we, we our, our increase of animal products goes up simultaneously, right? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a scare that when China and their growing middle class will demand even more, right? I think we need to start shifting those narratives. And I think it needs to start in the, in the global north specifically because there's a much more of a cultural, uh, economic and um, environmental responsibility there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for answering my quick question. Uh, so we're just moving on to the Q&A. So there are some questions from Dennis. Uh, so I think it's for any panelist or maybe all, um, if you can maybe see the Q&A, so how best, how can we best connect stakeholders from different areas that are government, private sector, NGO, farmers, any other actors in supply chain who have very different priorities in language, timeframes, etc. So anyone would like to take that? 
I'm, I'm happy to speak to it. Uh, sure. Also just noting I'm, I'm very extroverted. I've been trapped in my little uh, Corona apartment for a long time. So I don't want to jump the gun here. But I, 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 okay, I can't speak to it because that's what we do a lot. Um, I, I would say it's, it's a really good, good question. Um, for me, it's a lot about very different languages that she kind of brings up as well. Um, so a lot of different ways of talking about it. Um, so to, for sort of my background in philosophy and business management, it kind of, uh, they say like the students of that kind of become the, 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 the grandchildren of Karl Marx and Coca-Cola, right? If you have sort of a direct lineage. So trying to understand these different ways that, that motivates, let's say, the free market, right? Where it's about expanding, penetrating new markets, um, reducing costs, reducing, uh, uh, minimizing risks in your entire supply chain. And so if you take that language, for example, and you apply that to the animal agriculture sector, which uh, an initiative called the FAIR initiative, a huge uh, investor co collaborative. They have, I think, $23 trillion in the combined investment portfolio. They started in 2016 with just, I think, over one, like one billion or so, and now it's really exploded. And they're looking at all the risks that are inherent in the livestock supply chain, right? With drought, uh, so the crops go bad and the huge input needed and heat uh, stress days that where cattle die from that and you know pandemics breaking out and so on. And if you sort of apply an economic language to the model of livestock, you actually find, wow, if we step back and we just cut out the, the middle cow, so to speak, we have a much more um, shock resistant supply chain, right? Um, for, for the people here on this call, and Damita, for example, mentioned their Meat Free Mondays messaging was focused on animal welfare, right? But how can we translate those, those metrics? And now I'm just using the, the market examples, but in general, I think there's, um, uh, there was, uh, there, we need to take a lot of time uh, devote time to listen and understand and learn the languages of these other groups to sort of bring them together, not just come with our uh, pre-existing notions of it. There's, a, I think, a, a philosopher from, from Greece, Epictetus, said that you can't learn something that you think you already know. I think it's a lot about sort of, uh, you know, we have one mouth and, and, and two ears, right? I'm going to stop, stop using mine. Um, does anyone else also want to maybe take that question? I'll, I can add a little bit. Yeah, um, we we definitely see a lot of different types of stakeholders, especially when we're doing work with cities, um, which is one of our main um, strategies right now, because we've you know found that people expect the government to take action on this issue as sort of a leader and they look to the government for guidance and um, there was a Chatham House report that basically reported this, like governments can't get away with not taking action on this and they need to be the leaders. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work in that space with trying to get governments to implement uh, default veg type language and strategy into their climate action plans. And we're starting at the city level and working around the country. And I think there are so many stakeholders, right, um, in a city, you have, you know, just all different industries, um, community groups, uh, citizens with very various different interests. Um, and so it's hard to kind of rally everyone together around the the same idea. But I think just, yeah, like, like David mentioned, trying to um, see what their individual interests are and how this idea really plugs into those um, because it really is something that can, um, resonate with everybody. I think whether it's health or sustainability or work or justice, um, there's there's pretty much a reason, you know, for, for every audience that I think that um, just a plants by default strategy really uh, works well. And also I think a benefit of using this strategy is that it doesn't take away anybody's choice. And that's something that's really resonated with people and um, have made it a favorable approach because um, here in the U.S., at least, people are very, very attached to their meat, and I, I, David spoke about other regions, too, of the world where that's the case, um, and so, you know, they, they feel like when you're coming in and trying to take something away from them, th there's a lot of resistance and digging in your heels. Um, I think with this approach, it's very inclusive, so we're not trying to take anything away. We're just trying to, you know, shift what's the norm, but they could still eat the same thing if they want to. It's, it's just a nudge that encourages them not to. And so I think that helps with adoption is um, really just meeting people where they are and not trying to take anything away from them. 
thanks very much, Laura. Uh, so moving on, uh, Danica, maybe you could take the next question that we have. So maybe talking about just transition, it's in the Q&A box, you can have a look. Uh, talking about just transition, how can we make sure that we include the many informal and unregistered workers in the food sector, especially in developing countries? Danica, maybe you want to answer that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the first step is understanding these uh, marginalized and left out sectors, how they are impacted, how they fit in this whole transition process. Uh, so having a clear picture on that is the first step and uh, the most important part, I guess. And then, uh, you know, building partnerships with the other groups who take this transition action or lead this transition. Uh, so negotiating with them and uh, making them understand how it would impact these specific communities, uh, bring into the equation the different uh, impacts, not only these communities, but in return, the other uh, so-called privileged groups will have to face if these are not addressed. Has to be brought uh, into their attention in a, uh, in a, I, would, I, would, I don't know the word subtle is correct, but you know, in a, in a uh, non-aggressive format <laughs> initially uh, is a key way uh, to address uh, this issue. And also empowering these groups, you know, uh, developing their skills, making them aware, and uh, as much as possible ensuring that they are in the process and they find out the opportunities when this transition happens, uh, you know, what opportunities are available for them, how they would benefit from them is the, is the other aspect I would say that you need to focus on. Right. Thanks very much, Damika. So there are questions in the chat, we will get to that. But there's one very interesting question to Dora on uh, default wedge. So uh, Dennis has asked that in terms of the concept of default, it's interesting because, and he um, asks on how, if this could be applied to the producer instead of the consumer. So for example, if we could talk about default methods of crop cultivation to have default green transport methods and, you know, putting the onus on that side of the supply chain, is it, is it the similar sort of narrative that can be used for um, advocacy? Yeah, that's a really interesting thought. Um, that's that's not our um, you know business model. I guess I would say um, we're more focused on the consumer side and specifically with menus. Um, and I think the reason for that is because um, so using defaults um, in a menu setting, they're basically a behavioral nudge, um, which psychologists have studied for a very long time. This isn't new, um, like I mentioned with organ donation. And basically the concept is that you present options to people, uh, but you sort of make one option stand out more and they're just more likely to choose that one because it seems like the norm. And so it's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's kind of modifying people's behavior sort of very subtly and unconsciously. Um, and so that's why we're focusing on that end of things because it's been proven to be so successful time and time again with psychological um, behavioral research. Um, and so using these nudges is, is our particular model, but I think in a larger discussion about norms and defaults, it's it's very interesting because, you know, there's also been a lot of evidence that as humans, just as our species, we we operate um, so much around what what we think of as a norm, and it's that's why I think there's so much resistance to people, you know, going vegan outright because it's so scary to think that you're 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 alone in your community or your friends or friend group or your family um, and just being this strange, you know, vegan. So, so people like norms and specifically dynamic norms, I think are, are really big. So the, not just saying, you know, more people are vegan now, but saying more and more people are shifting towards plant-based, like actively it's happening, um, I think is really powerful because people are wanting to be part of the trend. Um, and so I think that broader concept can really be applied to anything, um, anything that you want to change, whether it's transportation or production, um, 
and just trying to, to whoever your stakeholders are, your decision makers, trying to push them along using that framing, I think can definitely be effective. We don't personally work on the producer side, but I do know a lot of groups do. Um, Mercy for Animals is another group that has a farm transformation project where they're actually helping farmers transition from um, raising livestock to raising vegetables and plant-based options. So um, a lot of groups doing great work on that side of things, but I would definitely be interested in seeing how defaults and norms could be applied on that side. So very interesting thought. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so moving on to the questions uh, on the chat. Uh, so let's start with the first question to David. Uh, it's impressive, I think you've read this question. So this question on creating partnerships over a short period of time and how you've managed to build it so effectively. So, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Uh, I've, I've just passed it on on our Slack chat to our colleagues as well, because it's we have a very sort of abstract work. It's very hard to get down to KPIs. Uh, like what are we actually sort of achieving? Um, so it's nice with some some tangible feedback, but our sort of collection of, of logos there, our little own sort of Pokemon hunt is, is going quite well, I would say. Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, then being being more modest. I think uh, there's there's a person who said nothing is more powerful than an uh, idea whose time has come, and so looking at the big like a bit larger forces at stake. Um, food systems is just growing in importance in um, awareness everywhere. So what, one being, for example, within the UNFCCC framework that that I can trust also operates under. You know, previously it's been a lot of debate around shifting energy, which is great and really important to achieve the, the Paris Agreement. And now I'm not saying that we're, we're already there where we need to be with energy, but now we're also uh, starting to look a lot more at agriculture, which is a lot more complex beast, beast overall. Um, but the, the sort of the spotlight is on that, right? And it's just growing in awareness. There's a lot, there's the business case has been made. Laura mentioned the Beyond Burger. There's a lot more growing of like alternatives to make it much more easily and accessible and the culture shifting as well. So one example from the US, um, they surveyed uh, three generations, generation Y, uh, sorry, yeah, no, the baby boom generation. So just after the second world war, uh, it was 1% to identify as vegetarian. The following one, generation Y, it was four uh, percent, and the millennial generation was twelve percent. Right, so you see this uh, curve going up because it spreads like wildfire um, on social media. With the millennials, they're very open to that. They copy paste behaviors and attitudes uh, directly from social media on a global level, right, through influence and so on. So we're not siloed to um, also fashion and those kinds of things. In that much in countries anymore because it spreads. Uh, it's a very aware sort of woke uh, generation as well. So there's just a lot more going on in society around that. So a lot of groups, I think if we started it up five years ago, there wouldn't be main, that many groups working on it. Um, the movie Cowspiracy came out and sort of put spotlight on the need for environmental organizations to include this as well. So there's been, just been a lot of movement. So a lot of groups who are already working on it a bit before or are scaling up their efforts and new groups are sort of joining and setting up meat reduction programs. And, and then I think, um, and 50 by 40 just came, came in a good place saying like, now is the time to start learning from each other. So, so that would be sort of my, my answer to that. Okay, thanks very much. And also I think what you mentioned as uh, from the millennial point of view, being a millennial, I must say, I think flexitarianism is picking up a lot. And I think what, you're, what Leo and Laura both mentioned about making the gradual transition as opposed to going outright vegan or vegetarian is, is encouraged more as well. So uh, some of the questions I am going to overlook because I think uh, we already answered some of them. Um, so there's a question from Ashan to Laura on if there is any scope of uh, expanding the research to Asian countries such as Sri Lanka and uh, India since the research findings might be different as well. Yeah, great question. So I definitely want to reemphasize um, what David said about a lot of the onus being on some of the more Western countries like the United States and Europe um, to do much of this reduction work. I think we've we've created a lot of this problem and um, that's where default veg is really focused is um, 
Europe and the US. Um, we're doing a little bit of work, hopefully in Australia too, but um, we, we specifically focus in these regions of the world. However, um, we would definitely be interested in partnerships that um, you know, work with local groups in other areas of the world. Default Veg is a very new program. Um, it's only about a year old here in the US, maybe a little less, um, launched at the very end of last year. And then of course, coronavirus hit and sort of just changed the trajectory of everything, I think for all of us. But um, so we, we definitely are expanding and growing rapidly. And I think are very interested in partnerships with other areas of the world, um, keeping in mind that those would be led by the groups in their own respective countries. And we could provide, you know, the, the idea from default veg, the idea of centering plant-based meals and help with, you know, um, using the case study calculations, um, menu design, things like that, but really relying on the expertise of um, the local group. So if anybody on this call is interested in um, adopting this kind of strategy, definitely let me know. And we'd love to, um, you know, see how it works in other areas of the world and how it would have to be modified um, to be culturally appropriate. And yeah, for sure. All right, thank you. And I think I think some of uh, some of the attendees on the call will be in touch with you because I think, as I did mention, this is an area that we've been struggling at maybe forming this sort of partnerships with institutions when it comes to uh, the the so-called conversion of uh, into vegetarianism or flexitarian diets so or making vegetarian the default option. So thank you very much. Uh, so there's a question I think maybe David would like to take it on the EU Parliament. Uh, it's on the chat for those who want to have a read. Yes, thank you. So it's mentioning what's probably reached some of you uh, guys' newsfeed as well. Um, the EU voted this week on what was supposed to be this ban on the label veggie burger. Can you call a burger that has like a plant-based uh, patty, can you call that a veggie burger? Should we call it something else? The same for plant-based dairy. Can you call it plant milk? Can you call it almond milk? Can you call it... Um, uh, Ah, I should be knowing these, but soy milk and so on, or should we actually call it like a soy drink and so on? Um, and the, the sort of uh, basis for what that comes, everybody who's sort of knowing a little bit about it, it's very uh, clear that it's sort of the, you call it the swan song of a of sort of incumbent industry, if you could call it in a fancy word, but actually it's the, the, the agricultural lobby that's heavy on livestock in EU that has pushed to put the sort of stick in the wheel because like veggie burgers and plant-based alternatives has been around for ages. There's um, back to uh, some murals two, 200 years before Christ, uh, or I think even further back, there's uh, depictions of tofu on murals in China. So it's been around for ages, uh, alternatives to meat, protein uh, uh, rich alternatives. But now they're actually gaining market squares and they're threatening, well, you can see that in the, in the dairy industry specifically with plant-based uh, taking up, up around up to 20%. Uh, percent. I'll, I'll link something here in, in, in a little while around that specifically. With the plant-based meat sector, it's less so, but they are seeing the shifts. Um, so some organizations are being reactive and as Laura put it, like digging their heels in as well and saying, okay, so this was like a, a campaign to say it's confusing for consumers who pick up a bur burger uh, next to another burger and they don't know if it's a plant-based or if it's like traditional meats. Uh, so it's confusing, right? But we have used the term coconut milk and so on and so forth. But, so that's a little bit about the background, um, but it was voted down. So you are able to call a veggie burger a veggie burger. Um, and uh, there were some restrictions on the dairy, uh, the plant-based dairy in terms of using it. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what it's going to land on, because now, of course, there's a lot of uh, the groups such as ProVeg and a lot of other CFI um, not being around this issue and using actually using this as a momentum to create a lot of focus on why we need to shift to the plant-based foods. When it comes to the dairy, uh, the plant-based dairy industry, I'm not that concerned because it already has a lot of market shares um, and people already very, they know how to use it, right? There's not a lot of confusion there, whether you call it a, an oat drink or a soy drink and it has those cartons anyway. So I don't think that's gonna mean a lot. I think it's more on the thing with plant-based meats that's just quite novel but luckily that didn't go through. Um, so yeah, one other strategy that we're seeing huge meat companies such as Cargill in the US and, and Tyson, they are shifting their understanding of themselves actually. Um, so Cargill has, uh, I think two years ago, three years ago, they shifted 
from call, uh, the subsidiary of them called Cardio Meat Solutions shifted to call themselves Cardio Protein Solutions. Right? So they think, oh, we're a protein provider that opens up to the market of, of plant protein, potentially cell-based as well. They set up a very nice a new protein headquarters, they called it, and they even have a, a protein president. That might be a bit of a more US cultural thing to, to go that far, but I think there's, there's a lot to be said that there's certain groups that, that start saying, okay, we're just gonna be part of this new, this new wave, this new industry, right? And they can shift, but there are cattlemen's association in the US and similar in Europe that do push for more conservative legislation because they're sort of more focused on, okay, it has to come from an animal or protein and, and calories. So it's a really interesting example to speak to a lot, but I think the, yeah, the conversation is still ongoing. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks very much. I'm just gonna take one more question. I'm gonna combine two questions, if that's okay. Um, so I, I, I would like if all panelists could answer. Um, so the, I'm just gonna combine the two questions. So the question that Nipun has asked on what are the key challenges that you've identified in transitioning from plant-based to, uh, well, transitioning into plant-based from a regular meat uh, heavy diet, as well as the question on um, uh, what Fallon is asked on the effective approaches to reaching plant-based food systems and bringing in the concepts of entrepreneurship, home gardening, women and youth empowerment related to meat reduction and sustainable consumption. I would like if all panelists could maybe answer this in like two minutes and then we'll move on to the final remarks. Since David will spin, maybe you could start and Danica and Laura. Thank you. So should I, should I start? Is that how I get it? Um, so when it comes to barriers, and as understood, it's on individual diets, dietary change. So, so I think that that's where sort of uh, uh, very well-researched behavioral nutting initiatives such as the default veg comes in. Um, so looking at, at, at the sort of the consumer as at the far end of a long range of incentives, right? You come down to the supermarkets, um, you're tired, your ch ch children are waiting at home, you just wanna get stuff over with, then you're just gonna go uh, with whatever is, it feels normal and easy to you, right? So I think when before that choice is actually made, there's a lot of sort of incentives and not just towards certain things. So increasing the availability is super important. Um, and as, as Laura mentioned, even with the fact with default wedge, you're not taking away people's choice because they can't just go over to the other, where the meat option, if they want that, right? So there's no, sort of uh, infringement on their autonomy of choices as well. Um, yet I think an, an, under an, an underestimated one that's also very, very abstract is the cultural components of what we're used to, like our grandparents cooking so-and-so for us for Christmas, or as you mentioned, uh, Thanksgiving as well, these, these culturally uh, uh, significant uh, periods where it's sort of a gift to be presenting, let's say the turkey or something else, or your grandmother's meatballs and saying no to that can can feel uh where for some teenagers they make pride in saying no to to old old things right but um i think that that's something that's that we need to ha be having a discussion as well i think the more it normalizes right i mentioned there's 12 percent u.s millennials considering themselves vegetarian uh from there there's a lot more flexitarians right so the more it normalizes because there's a study showing for young people who still live with their parents one of the main barriers was actually their parents sort of control over what they eat and they didn't want to stand out because we are sort of, uh, yeah, herd uh, animals in that sense, flock animals. So I think those two components, more choices and also more awareness and cultural openness to it. Thank you. Um, maybe we'd want to also attempt to answer that. I think basically uh, David covered most of it. Uh, Adding to that would be, you know, uh, the cultural aspect and also uh, something that came very interesting is the, is the faith based uh, uh, you know, areas, are, so, 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 some uh, strategies that we could use to bring it in. Yeah, uh, basically that's what I also need to add from my end. Thank you, Dante. Laura? Yeah, I think David covered a lot of it. Um, I think the, the whole idea of normalizing plant-based foods is important and that's basically what Default Veg sets out to do. Um, 
that has been, I, I think, you know, just one of the one of the main barriers I've encountered in the last ten years of doing plant based advocacy is is it being perceived as sort of not normal. And I think um, the more we lean into the research about what I mentioned, these dynamic norms of more and more people are choosing this. It's becoming much more widespread. I think it makes it more popular. Also, when when you're thinking about businesses approaching them, um, the business case you can make is that because more and more people are choosing it, um, and there's also people who suffer from you know allergies and things like that, adopting this inclusive menu will help your business strategy and help you bring in more customers. Um, another barrier I think that we've also experience like I've mentioned is the coronavirus. I think that's everybody's big barrier right now. Um, we've, we've heard from a lot of institutions that they aren't really actively making decisions like this right now because they're shut down. Um, here, the schools just sort of keep changing, you know, one one day they're open and then another one closes, another one reopens. And it's just, it's, it's a really chaotic time, I think, for everybody. Um, we are trying to, you know, be flexible and patient, but um, we, we're actually finding that some groups are using the downtime where they might not be having events to actually put plans in place so that um, when they are having events, they can um, more you know, be more prepared to offer resilient foods. So there's that, you know, one upside of things for sure. Um, and yeah, I think lastly, um, going back to the norms and um, we, the Thanksgiving example, I think was a really great one. We we're trying to celebrate different cultures and kind of normalize that um, because, you know, here in the U.S. it's just very based in Western traditions. Um, and that's where people feel comfortable. And I think just kind of shaking that up a little bit is important for us. And um, like the Thanksgiving idea with the decolonize your Thanksgiving, we're finding these, you know, tribal groups, they have recipe booklets that are actually mostly vegetarian already, just because they rely on, you know, easy to access ingredients, local ingredients that um, are easy to harvest and um, sustainable. And um, so these recipe booklets that we're working on with them only actually have a couple of meat options to begin with. So just elevating that and helping people realize that um, there are so many wonderful and delicious and healthy options out there that might be a little bit outside of their normal comfort spe sphere, but that, um, you know, these things can become normal and celebrated. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I'm just going to give you all like two minutes while I speak to gather your final thoughts for any closing remarks. But what uh, Laura, you just mentioned in your last statement was so true because we actually have some ground level research that we are doing in the agriculture zone in Sri Lanka, and we also did a small, we did a few, we ran a few questions with some of them on, um, we ran a few questions with some of them on their um, food consumption habits and actually a lot of them are vegetarian by default because first the access to meat and fish and eggs is not available and secondly the cost so the problem is definitely Tomorrow we have a keynote address with Dr. Anna Britton, who is a senior research fellow at the University of Vermont. She will be speaking on degenerative design for the food, for the food water, waste, and energy nexus in times of crisis. And on Thursday, we have another session on inclusive partnerships for sustainable and regenerative food systems with Dr. Susika Sugadabana, who is also on the call, she's a senior consultant here at Like and Trust, as well as Dr. Amanda Katili, who is your manager of Climate Reality Project Indonesia. So we have five more minutes, and maybe if each of the panelists could um, take one and a half minutes to give a closing remark, we could end with that. Maybe Laura, since you ended, we could start with you. Yeah, definitely. So um, again, thank you so much for having me here. And um, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all and just kind of um, share this idea that I think is really customizable for, you know, any, any setting, any institution um, across different cultures. And I think we have really designed it to just be, you know, not our campaign that we own, but just a tool that we provide, a resource that we provide that anyone can adapt and sort of make it their own. Um, and we're hoping in the future to be able to, you know, work with different groups to have it available in different languages with different types of cultural recipes available. Um, we do have our recipe tool on our website where we can um, put 
uh, different collections together that highlight certain types of recipes um, that other groups can use. And um, if you want to submit recipes to that, you can. Um, and so then it, it, like I said, it links back to the chef or the original recipe blogger. So um, you can always find the original source and um, get to their site. So that's a great tool for the public. And um, if you, yeah, if you go to our website, defaultveg.org, you'll find that recipe tool along with a page of resources. Um, so if you're a student and you want to use the strategy for your school, there's a, a sheet about how to do that. Also in your office, um, that's, uh, that's a common one we get is, you know, office catering orders. Um, so defaultveg.org is where you can find all of that and feel free to get in touch with us on the site. And we're happy to help you and give you resources and help you connect with others in your community if you want to, you know, encourage a larger institution to make this switch. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Laura. Uh, Damiton? Yep. Uh, I would actually like to thank the two other panelists for like very insightful uh, information that was very important for us as a regional think tank, especially working in Asia and Africa. There were a lot of uh, informative and useful things that we uh, gathered from them. Uh, so I would like to uh, trust more on like uh, on emphasizing on the just transition aspect and also sustainable consumption and production, which we need to, you know, engage the vulnerable local communities and also the national level stakeholders, bridging the gap between them and ensuring that uh, the, the communities that the marginalized communities were left out, uh, 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 they are brought into the table, uh, the ideas are taken in and ensure that when we do this transition, uh, we are able to, you know, have a sustainable food comes um, uh, system with the inclusion of these marginalized groups. Yeah, thank you so much and thanks for having me. It's really been been a pleasure. Uh, also, at least trying to be uh, getting to be a little bit more extrovert than than has been the case for for a while. Uh, well, yeah, I, I would like to um, so sum up my own sort of experience a little bit uh, from having been in this space for a while. I actually worked with the Meat Free Mondays for five years in Denmark just to join the sort of the cool club here of the panelists as well. We did, uh, we did a survey at the big uh, hospital there um, where the canteen shift to meet three Mondays and they were interested in seeing like how many people were actually happy about it, right? And we actually found out that 94% uh, were on varying degrees. 33% of those were like super excited. Finally, it's happening. And it was like, yeah, this is great, good for the environment. And someone like, yeah, this tastes good. And then you had 6% who were like, no, we, we don't want like this and that. Uh, we want our meat and so on, the uh, sort of second amendment rights. But uh, it was just interesting that the people we were working with at the hospital, they had the sense that, uh, wow, like this could be a very, very contentious issue, right? But it's kind of when you go on Facebook forums and you see like the two outer positions, the vegan vegetarian on one side and the hardcore bacon fanatic on the other and you see those discussions going on and you think, that, oh, wow, this is either like there's a civil war breaking out or it's the presidential election in the US. It's so polarized, right? Um, but when you then look at the silent majority, which is like they kind of keep silent and eat their vegetables and they're sort of moving in that direction, right? But I do think it's interesting to look at why it can be such an ideological debate, right? Um, coming from sort of my own experience also as a man where you know real men, men eat meat and having written and researched on that topic as well and sometimes people challenge me like where do you get the protein can you build muscle and so on these traditional tropes but I think it's interesting that plant-based sort of symbolizes the plant eating symbolizes a shift in in our relationship to nature right it is a different way of living with it I've grown a lot more joyful of uh, going to see a farm sanctuary, uh, looking at, at animals living as, as they can be and being as joyful as they can, and also the natural world as such, knowing that I'm sort of contributing to, to preserving that. And so from my own little bubble of being, yeah, very much surrounded by all these victories all the time where we share uh, default vex, which just came into a new city in the U.S. or so on and so forth, all these groups working to promote it. So definitely like a little echo chamber but I do see a lot of progress in, in that uh, regard. And I do think we are sort of on the cusp of, of shifting. Uh, I think that's also why it's getting more and more polarized because there's more conservative forces trying to sort of hold on to a vision of, of anthropocentrism and so on. So for my little bubble, it, it, it is 
uh, there's a lot, there's a very bright future ahead. It's going to be a bumpy road. So sort of summed up whether I think it's Oscar Wilde who said uh, a dreamer is someone who can only find their way by moonlight. And his curse is that he sees the dawn before everyone else. So there's like this, this bright light ahead that only sort of you can see, but luckily we have a, like a wide uh, network of dreamers um, to help us on this journey. So thank you. What a fantastic uh, note to end on. Uh, so thank you, Panvich, uh, once again, David, Laura, and Damita for taking time to be here. I think it was very insightful to bring in different perspectives from very different parts of the world, and uh, it's always nice to share experiences. So for those of you who have been joining us, please do join us tomorrow for the keynote address. And until then, please stay safe, stay indoors, wash your hands, and the usual. So until then, thank you very much, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.